first one was in Vancouver, uh, down at English Bay. And then, so that's when I was 18, and then also when I was 18, I completed my first Ironman uh, Canada distance triathlon. And again, for those that may not know, uh, the Ironman distance is a 3.8 kilometer swim, a 180 kilometer bike ride, uh, finished by the full 42.2 kilometer run. And so I did that when I was 18. And I also, uh, backing up a little bit, yeah, when I was yeah. 17, uh, ran my first marathon in Calgary and finished with a time of three hours and 24 minutes. Uh, I also ran a marathon in Vancouver when I was 17. And then again, when I was 18, uh, ran two more uh, marathons um, when I was 18. And then when I was 20, completed my second Ironman Canada triathlon. So that's great. You did a lot of things by the age of 18. A lot of things that kids are still at school really doing. Not, I'm not saying they're not doing much, but they're not doing these huge achievements. And when you talk about the distance of a, an Ironman, it's so long. It's so, it takes so long to do. And you managed to um, get that done. How did you really get your mindset around doing that at such a young age? At that time, I guess I was a little bit brash, you could say. Okay. And a little bit of one-upmanship where ran a 10k and so if I ran a marathon you know I could say that I ran a marathon yeah um, or do a triathlon and then stepping it up to Ironman distance so it was a bit of a bravado um, okay. thing at the time it worked though you ran it worked, didn't yeah, you? So, it did yeah uh, but I mean I'm glad looking back at it I mean it's an achievement and for me personally it really took me out of a comfort zone and it forced me uh, to, to concentrate on training and actually it created a lifestyle, uh, a healthy lifestyle. Um, I, I may have just sat on the couch otherwise yeah. or, or you know, at the computer or something like that, but I wanted to be outside. And again, looking back to my elementary days, I didn't like being in school. I didn't like being in the classroom. I'd always <laughs> look out the window. I wanted to be outside. I uh, didn't really enjoy being indoors and so that was an outlet for me uh, in addition to being a challenge and and creating a lifestyle basically that uh, a healthy lifestyle and a goal I also found that in the years that I wasn't training for Iron Man or that uh, I kind of felt lost a little bit yeah. because there wasn't this goal that was months away and there's this constant target that having to reach certain levels all the way along uh, in order to reach the final goal. Uh, and not in those years that I didn't have that, I felt a little bit lost and a little bit aimless uh, during those years. Isn't that interesting that in elementary that you were looking outside, knowing that you should be outside, and then look how your life is now sculpted now. And one thing that we do in the curriculum here in BC is we talk about children going towards what their passion is, not necessarily being an A and a B student and trying to excel academ academically. We talk about children doing what they're supposed to do and go towards their passions. So it's, it's almost like you did that back then without realising. I know it looks like you're going against the grain, but it's interesting you say that you sat in there looking out, thinking that you should be outside. And that's where once you had the opportunity to be outside when you're in grade 12, you were. You know, I know you did it earlier than the grade 12, but that's when you had the big events that you, you trained for and did that. Now, did you get much support when you were young in kind of going towards those events? Or did you find that you did a lot of training on your own? Well, I did a lot of training on my own just because of the physical output of it. Um, a lot of my friends, although they were cyclists or that, mm -hmm. uh, they still may not have been wanting to go out for that long, As long of a ride yeah, than yeah. that. So, and then for running, um, a lot of my friends weren't runners, so I would have to go and run and swim. So a lot of the training was by myself, uh, which is fine. I'm okay with that. And then as far as support, yeah, my friends really enjoyed, you know, they'd sometimes come out and watch. Okay. And my parents actually really enjoyed uh, coming out to watch when I was a teenager. And, you know, when I first did Ironman, you know, my mom was, you know, so proud. A mom. Oh, so proud. Yes. <laughs> you know, so the only worried, one screaming at, worried at first, yes. right, of, of, you know, saying I'm going to do this yeah. and a little bit apprehensive. But after I'd done it and then the second time, you know, coming out to watch, you know, she loved to be able to come out and watch the, the running events or the, 
the running and biking. Anything where she could be surprised. Yeah. yeah. She and so yes, then by. afterwards she was always excited to be watch watch it, be part of it, and, yeah. and enjoy that. No, that's good. Where do you think your inner drive came from? Like you seem to me from a very young age, I've had something in you that has this amazing inner drive. Do you think that was instilled in you as a child? I t- talked earlier about me having it given to me as a child from my parents. They made me very ambitious from a young age by just mere support in doing things that I did. Where could you kind of explain your inner drive? Because a lot of people at that young age don't have it. Where do you think that came from? I think it's just something really I was born with. Okay. And so just by nature, um, that was the gift I was given. Yeah. And, and everyone has a talent. And whether it's one talent or two talents or five talents, um, everybody has some sort of yeah, talent. True. My talents may be a little bit different. Yeah, that's okay. We like to be different. That's yeah. right. Um, so we all use our talents and, and that. And so I think that was what I was given and the gift. And just and also my parents, uh, they're super talented people. Uh, my dad is a professional musician and plays multiple instruments and he's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. And so, I mean, he's very good at what he does. And then other things that he does as well. He's also very talented at it. Actually, I'm a little bit jealous <laughs> of all the things that he's capable of doing. And that, but just all through my family, a lot of people, like my cousins that played hockey and, and others. So, I think so you've been a family. family of high achievers then as yes. well, haven't you? Where you've been given gold yourself, mm-hmm. not people haven't directed the goals towards you, but you've had the goals and you've, it's not looked impossible, has it? Right, exactly. You know, when your dad's doing his music, musician and he's, he's learning all these instruments, he's not thinking, oh, I can't learn this, I already know this. And your cousins that have done hockey and been doing well at that, yes. they haven't thought, oh, how high can I get with this? You know, they know they've done well with it. So I think probably, you know, I talked earlier about surrounding yourself with people that kind of have that positive and that, that driven way. But listening a bit more about your family, I feel like you were around a lot of high achievers anyway. So for you to go and want to do an Ironman that's this big, it didn't feel like, of course you didn't want to do the 10K. You know, of course you want to do the big thing. So I really, really understand about that. How do you think the breakdown of everything came together for you and fitting it in? So you're still a young man, you're age 20. How did that fit in with just everything in your life that's going on at that time? Well, after doing the second Ironman, which I really enjoyed, uh, again, coming off of that, I do tend to find I was a little bit lost, a little bit aimless, uh, trying to find something that would fill that same, what I got from the Ironman and from the training, like I enjoyed the training so much and to find something that has that discipline, has that output. And oftentimes I couldn't find that. And so I did feel a little bit aimless uh, for a while. Right. Um, But, you know, now coming, you know, years later now, uh, or when I moved to Kelowna, I... I moved to Kelowna just to train uh, for Ironman Canada and because I wanted to be here in the climate uh, close to Penticton uh, where it's hot in the summertime to train in that. And, and so again, coming to Kelowna, I felt that sense of uh, direction, the sense of aim. Uh, there was a target at the end. And uh, so I really enjoyed getting back into the training, um, coming to Kelowna. And then after, so living here in Kelowna, I was able to do Ironman Canada three more times, so for a total of five times. And But moving here, I moved here, I was a summer boy and really enjoyed the heat of the summer and really didn't really enjoy the winter. So during the winter, I often wouldn't do very much sit around. I was about to ask you about your training. That was my next question. I was As soon as you said that, I was going to ask you about your winter training. So you really went hard from... April to November, would you say? Or October, yeah. Okay, once, once oh, the even weather, October. <laughs> once the weather changed. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, and then in the winter, I would ease back and come springtime again. I think I still had the same fitness level. Okay. And realized that I had that you didn't. lost. So I <laughs> yeah. had to build it up again. Had to get ambitious again to, to do that. To okay. Top, but, yeah. And then somewhere around 2006, 2007, I uh, started doing a little bit of snowshoeing in the winter and enjoying it yeah because you know um, it's, it's strenuous because you probably went for a long way you didn't probably go for an hour you probably went for five hours didn't you or be right? a few hours yeah anyways. you were you'd probably go longer right. than an hour so although it was strenuous it's quite enjoyable to snowshoe um 
it's less injury prone as well. So you probably didn't injure yourself doing that, oh, did no. you? No, because no. It's, it's soft impact and it's nice terrain that you kind of just have to. And I felt that it was it was a really good workout yeah, in the is. sense of it's it provides the resistance in the snow. And it's the, heavy and you have to push in there. The yes, and, and that's why I found it was a very good workout. And so so you found one winter thing that you could train with at least. Yes, that's that was right. good. You found one thing here. And so, so yeah, so I, that kind of lit the spark, I guess. Yeah. And then I believe it was around 2007, uh, I was attending a uh, fundraiser. And after the fundraiser, they handed out a, a pamphlet for another fundraiser. And that was a trek to um, Mount Everest Base Camp. Okay. And at that time... Uh, I was working a lot, so I wasn't really able to do it. And I also thought that the trek to base camp was a lot harder than what it was. And then shortly after that, I was watching a television documentary, and uh, the host did a trek to base camp. So I got to see it and realized it wasn't as hard as what I had imagined it to be. It's still a pretty good trek. Yes, uh, but just but not, it looked manageable because you saw somebody do yes, it, and you I, know what you're capable of. You know your ambition. You know that you're strong in those areas. You know you talked about we've all got a talent some way. Some way, you weren't put off by that documentary. It actually looks to me like it. It kind of inspired you to really, really take it seriously. Then. Exactly. Good, and good. so actually, just you know, watching that. Yeah. That's where the it kind of the light bulb came on. It's like, and you went there. It is. I can do that. Yeah. Great. And the whole like. I decided like yeah. to do the whole Mount Everest um, for the uh, at that time, um, but then I thought, okay, what's really involved? Like, I need to research of what's involved, what equipment do I need, what gear do I need, and what's it really like. And so, as I started doing more research and finding out what it was like, then it more and more it became, yes, I I can do this. I I feel I have the talent to do it the capability to do it and the ability to do it. And so started looking into it more and more and purchasing the gear uh, that I would need in order to actually accomplish it. Okay. So then in 2008, I uh, signed on to do uh, a trek uh, climb up Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is the highest peak in Washington State at 14,410 feet. And it's a Mount Rainier is the fourth most dangerous mountain in North America. And so well, you didn't think it was dangerous because you went anyway, time. didn't yes, you? Yes, I went anyways. <laughs> However, I did a practice trip up Mount Rainier. Okay. And after coming back home, I discovered that some people had died a few days um, before I had been up there. And you um, found that out afterwards? You didn't know that as you approached, as you went up, you didn't know? Uh, well, I found out after I got back from my practice Okay. prior to going right. to my full trip to the summit so it was a little bit on my mind at the time and that but because you knew it was dangerous and now you really knew it was dangerous because yes, it happened to them okay, that's right yeah but the guides were fantastic and the weather was perfect the temperature was great low winds and it was just one of those ideal days where the blue sky and low winds uh, so made for an excellent good uh trip of so a that climb. kind of raised your confidence on that day that first day going up then going okay this is good Yes, this so, is going to go well. So reaching Good. reaching uh, the crater of uh, Mount Rainier uh, as the sun rises is fantastic. So if anyone feels that they want to do Mount Rainier, I highly recommend it. So you really enjoyed that. It was that fantastic. One. Yeah. Yes. Good. So um, Good. and that. So but still, even doing that, um, coming back is like I need to do something else to be sure that I could take the next step towards Mount Everest. And so the following year, a buddy and I, we went down to Colorado uh, to do some training. So we spent two weeks down in Colorado. And during that time, we had perfect weather again and the easy access to the Colorado 14ers, as they call them. Okay. Uh, those are the uh, Colorado has 54 peaks over 14,000 feet. And so I was able to do 18 of those 14,000 foot peaks in 12 consecutive days. And so it was 250 kilometers Amazing. hiking in 12 days, 60,000 feet of elevation gain and 60,000 feet of descent. Uh, so it was after that, then I was like, okay, now I can take the next step towards um, my, my expedition uh, from Mount Everest. And so again, continued purchasing the gear, 
uh, that I would need for the extreme conditions of Mount Everest and just stepping up the training and that. No, that's great. That's so good because that kind of got you ready then on the way to knowing that the bigger...